There is a right way to be fortunate. Our text this morning is Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this day as we look at your word, your gospel. We pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts and our ears, that we might hear your word, that we might be encouraged by your word, that we might do your word, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was driving down, down a tough street in the East San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles when I saw a baffling sight, an establishment covered with ambiguous but colorful murals that was called Jello World. Someone thought they were going to make a fortune with a Jello restaurant in the middle of the hood. It wasn't long before it was out of business because fortune doesn't follow foolish decisions. This morning we'll also see someone following a foolish path as the Gospel of Luke shows us. Fools follow fortunes. Fools follow fortunes. Go ahead and open up your Bibles. Luke chapter 12, we're going to begin in verse 13. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. And there it says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? Now the context is this. Jesus is speaking to a huge crowd. The crowd is so large and they're so intent on hearing what Jesus is saying and Jesus is doing that they're actually beginning to trample over one another. Now, the stuff that Jesus is talking about is deadly serious business. Here's what it says in verse 8 of chapter 12. It says, And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men... The Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how you shall defend yourself or what you shall say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So Jesus is speaking about deadly serious stuff. He's speaking about confessing him before men, and Jesus will confess him before the angels of heaven. He's also saying, deny me before men, and I will deny you before the angels in heaven. All sins will be forgiven except, except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And for that one, there is damnation. And furthermore, he says, you, my people, are going to be brought before rulers and authorities. They're going to want to charge you. They're going to want to put you to death. But don't worry in that hour. The Spirit will give you words to speak. Serious stuff. And in the midst of this, we've got this man asking this request of Jesus. The man seems to want someone to argue with his older brother over his share of the inheritance. Now, the way it's worded, it seems that this is a younger sibling. This is how it worked in Israel in the first century. Older brothers got 50% of the inheritance. If he had another brother, he got 50% too. But if there were more brothers, it was all divided up. So if you had, say, a total of four boys, the older brother would get 50%, and the other three boys got a portion of that remaining 50%. This man seems to think he's been defrauded by his older brother, and so he comes to Jesus. Jesus responds back to him, Who made me a judge or arbiter over you? Who made Jesus simply a lawyer rabbi who will argue with his brother over property? Now, you've likely seen before the scribes and the lawyers. At this time in Israel, you had experts on the law. They were lawyers like we have today, except their law was based on the law of God. And if you had a dispute, maybe a boundary dispute or a situation like this, you feel like you got defrauded in an inheritance, you would call in one of these scribes or lawyers and they would look at the law and they look at the teaching of the rabbis and they would decide a case. But here this man wants to use Jesus in this way. The Bible commentator Alexander McLaren says, How many of us find the sermon time a good opportunity for thinking about investments and business? Fools follow fortunes. Going on to verse 15. And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now Jesus here seems to be perturbed by this man's request. Weighty matters are being discussed. Deadly serious business is being executed. Fools follow 
fortunes. And Jesus here says this, beware, beware. Be on your guard against all covetousness. Beware, and it's here, passes in the Greek, that means like all or everything. Play anexia. It means lusting after a greater amount of temporal things than you've been give, given. Beware of lusting after a greater amount of temporal things than you've been given. Friends, life is now about the abundance of things. Things are good. We live in a time and place where we've got a lot of leisure time. We get live in a time and a place where we've got a lot of extra money to do leisure things with. But life is not about the abundance of things. Bigger cars, bigger houses, more vacation homes, more money in the IRA. Here is the Savior of the world, Israel's Messiah, God in the flesh before this man, and he wants Jesus to argue with his brother over an inheritance dispute. Now, beyond all his covetousness, the problem with this man is he doesn't understand the times. A three-year period when Jesus has been revealed as Messiah. He's bringing the kingdom of God with him. He's preparing Israel for the moment when he's going to go to the cross. He's going to die. He's going to rise from the dead on the third day as Savior of the world and ascend to the right hand of the Father. And yet this man here wants Jesus to come and have a dispute with his brother. Fools follow fortunes. Verse 16, and he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. This man's business in the Greek is producing abundantly. The profits are staggering. The return on investment is through the roof. And notice that his first thought is, how do I store up my wealth? Not to use it for God's glory. Fools follow fortunes. Remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, echoing the teaching of Jesus. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. I want you to remember that. It's a good thing to work. It's a good thing to save. But one of the reasons why we're to work and be productive is so that we have something to share with anyone in need. And this man's first thought is, I've got all this stuff. I need to store it up. Going on to verse 18. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. Now friends, I want to say this. Ideas about wealth being evil in and of themselves is wrong. Saving up is not a bad thing. Investing, investing against the hard day is not a wrong thing. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4 says, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Kids, listen up. When you get to be an adult or even a teenager, you should work and save. Work and save. Work hard. The man here in our story in this parable has been diligent and has been blessed, but he keeps all the wealth and stores it up and up and up for himself. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. As for the rich of this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Some of you kids are going to be fabulously wealthy. There's probably somebody in this room that may invent some product that just takes off. What are you to do with that? What does the Word of God tell you to do? It tells you to save. It tells you to be wise. But it tells you also to be generous. Why? Because God gave it to you. God gave it to you as a gift. So give it as a gift. Going out of verse 19. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, likely you, as I did the first time I saw these words, immediately thought, hey, that's, that's the Greco-Roman cultural more, right? Eat, drink, and be merry. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Here's a Jew 
speaking to Jesus, and he comes back with this parable, and this person in this parable, this man who's wanting to store up wealth for himself, says, eat, drink, and be merry, and I think the message is this, do not absorb the ways of the world. The world tells us right now, eat, drink, and be merry. That's what it's all about. Relaxation, saving up so that you can go on vacations, buying yourself a tiny home. Is that what it's all about? God makes us a living soul, and God directs where our soul goes after death. Notice this man speaks to his own soul as though he's got control of it. We don't control our own souls. God does. He says to the eternal part of himself, I have everything I need to rest and enjoy life. Fools follow fortunes. Richie, Buddy, and JP were all under 30. They had fame, they had fortune, they had money pouring in in seemingly endless streams. Eat, drink, and be merry. Let's go on to verse 20. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? The man spoke to his soul and assured it of rest. But the real owner of the soul, God, comes to claim it. Psalm 39 verse 6 says, Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. You're going to leave your wealth to somebody. You should leave something to your kids. The Bible tells you to. But how many times do you see wealthy people and they've, they don't have kids. They leave their money behind to their lawyers and their cats. Richie Valens, Buddy Holly, and JP, the big bopper Richardson, got on a plane. They were going to another venue to do another concert, and they didn't want to drive in a car. It was too crowded, and there was a storm going on. You guys that are over 30 here, you know who I'm talking about. A lot of you guys who are under 30 are probably like, who are you talking about? In 1959, they were the biggest stars and their plane crashed in a cornfield and they all died. All were under 30, and God required their souls that night, and all that remains of them are small plaques in obscure cemeteries, and in a hundred years from now, who's even gonna remember who they are? Someone will go out into a cemetery and they'll see Richie Valens plaque there, and weeds will be growing over it, and they'll think, well, some obscure musical artist from over a hundred years ago. We're all so small and so fragile. You don't know when your soul will be required. Fools follow fortunes. Verse 21. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now we've got a two-fold problem presented here in verse 21. The first one is this. This person is laying up treasures for himself. Laying up treasures for himself. What does the Bible say? Well, Proverbs 13, 22, it says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Now, the inheritance is tangible. It's probably land, but I want to suggest there's something more to that. The most important inheritance you can leave for your children and your children's children, your grandchildren, is the faith. The faith. The Christian faith. Leave as an inheritance your example of the Christian faith. And leave as an inheritance a wise, tangible inheritance for your children and your children's children. So first of all, this man here in the parable of Jesus, who is an analog of that, that young man who's coming and saying, my brother's defrauded me, I need you to come and be my lawyer. The second problem in this twofold problem is this. He's not rich toward God. He's not rich toward God. What does your wealth really mean? What do paper dollars mean when the economy collapses? What is gold and silver when nobody's buying because the gold store is closed down and you got to take a $20 gold piece to buy a loaf of bread? What does it all mean? You know, Detroit in 1950 was called the Paris of the West. Beautiful city, bursting with wealth. Everybody's buying automobiles from the United States, and they're all coming out of Detroit. Beautiful neighborhoods with huge, magnificent mansions. People like the Fords live there. You go to the same neighborhoods today. Detroit, 
which had two million people in 1950, has barely over 500,000. You'll go down burned out streets and see vacant lots where magnificent mansions once stood, testifying to the great wealth of the person who built that home. And there's nothing there except a concrete foundation and trees growing over it. Why? Wealth fades. Kids, wealth fades. So don't put your trust in wealth. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be rich toward God. God's been rich toward you. God's been rich toward us. He gives you the breath of life. God gives you life, and every breath you take is a gift from God. He saved you through the death of his precious son. He gives you a purpose and material blessings. We have such purpose in this life. We're not, we're not going around wondering, where's our next slice of bread coming from? Opportunities open before us, and these are all thanks to gospel progress and the grace of God. Can I hear an amen to that? But more than that, he gives you a glorious future. We're heading somewhere. We live in a generation where people don't know who they are or where they're going. They're filled with angst. They think there's nothing to life, that it's meaningless, but we don't believe that way. We know this life is heading on a quest and that every one of you has a story, has a saga that's being taken down. If every careless word is going to be accounted for on the last day, that means your deeds will echo for eternity and your life has purpose. So be rich toward God for fools follow fortunes. Fashion designer, film director, and gay rights activist Tom Ford is the ultimate insider. He's a follower of the wisdom of this age. He foolishly stirred controversy, controversy by saying, that he wouldn't dress former First Lady Melania Trump. But he has also said some intriguingly unfoolish things. Ford has stated, life can be an endless, unfulfilling quest for some sort of happiness that is elusive. Death is all I think about. There's not a day or really an hour that goes by that I don't think about death. Here is a man who's gotten a glimpse of how foolish and dangerous following fortune can be. One day, Every single one of you is going to come to an end of your time living in this age. All of us are very fortunate in the time and place in which we live. Some of you are exceedingly fortunate. What are you following? Live in a way that is always generous toward God and recognizes that we are but a puff of mist here today, gone tomorrow, but eternity counts forever. This morning we've seen in Luke... Fools follow fortunes. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us and make us wise according to your word and your ways, not wise according to the world. Help us to know the times and places in which we live and to live in the blessings that you've given us and to use what you've given us wisely for your honor and glory. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.